Hello and welcome to Distillations. I'm Michal Maya, a historian of science and editor of Chemical Heritage magazine here at CHF. And I'm Bob Kenworthy, CHF's in-house chemist. This episode of Distillations falls a little over 100 years after the start of World War I. So we decided to take a look at the interplay of war and weapons and science from 1914 to 2014. Fogs of War, the many lives of chemical weapons. First, reporter Helena de Groot will take us to a field in Belgium where a farmer recently found seven tons of leftover mustard gas shells from World War I. And then we'll talk to Jeffrey Johnson and Amy E. Smithson. Jeffrey Johnson is a historian of science and technology at Villanova University with a special interest in the origins of chemical warfare. And Amy Smithson is a senior fellow at the James Martin Center for Nonproliferation Studies who specializes in modern day chemical and biological weapons and their proliferation. Chemical warfare, past and present, all coming up on Distillations. World War I began a hundred years ago, the distant past for most of us. But some people still feel its effects in a very real way. I am Johan de Vriends. I have a farm and I, I, yeah, I bought a little bit of uh, uh, leek, leek, uh, strawberries and um, lumkool. Uh, cauliflower. Cauliflowers, yes. De Vriends farm is in Flanders fields in Belgium. More than half a million people died here during the First World War. The front line ran straight through where he now grows crops. And along the whole length of the front line, ranging from the Belgian coast to the Swiss border, an estimated 1.5 billion shells were fired. But here's the catch. In Belgium, about one third of those bombs didn't go off. One reason was that the ground was often so soggy that they would sink into the wet dirt instead of exploding on impact. To this day, people from amateur collectors to construction workers to farmers find these bombs. They're an inconvenient and sometimes dangerous part of life. We don't talk about it with the other farmers. When we find one, we put it aside and work on. That's how it goes. If you have to wait till the police come and put caution tape around it, we don't do that. We put it aside and work on. Over 90% of the bombs people find in the region are ordinary shells. But 5% are chemical weapons, shells filled with a toxin. The most well-known, of course, is mustard gas. And that's where it gets really dangerous. Last February, when de Vrindt was plowing a new plot of land, he suddenly heard the sound of metal on metal. He stopped the machine only to discover that he had hit the biggest weapons dump ever to be found in the region. Seven tons of ammunition, over six tons of which contained mustard gas. The ammunition was never used, but time had taken its toll. We immediately uh, had some signs that it was toxic ammunition because we detected uh, that they were leaking. This is Commander Glenn Nolet of the Belgian Bomb Squad. I asked him how he detected the shells were leaking. The best way is the old-fashioned way, and it's it's by the nose, by smelling that something is wrong. And what does it smell like? Well, uh, it smells like freshly mown grass. But when you're on a field, um, (laughs) how do you know that it's not just freshly mowed grass and and that it's a toxin and that it's dangerous? Well, in this case, uh, the field was, uh, was plowed, so uh, there wasn't any grass <laughs> anymore. <laughs> Glenn Nolet works for Dovo, the department of the Belgian army that was specifically created to dismantle these antiquated bombs. 100 years after World War I began, this team still has plenty of work to do, enough to employ almost 200 people full-time. I wanted to find out how they dismantle all these bombs, so I visited their headquarters. I cannot let you go on the side. The line is, is over here and I cannot let you go because uh, the arsenic uh, pollution. Behind that line is the contained detonation chamber. That's where bomb technicians intentionally explode the discovered bombs, but they do it carefully inside an insulated tank. 
But first, each bomb is x-rayed and gamma-rayed to see what toxins it contains. Because if something goes wrong, the on-site medics have to know what antidote to use. This is one of our two x-ray cabins. I'm standing next to something that looks like a fridge in a restaurant. A room-sized box with a heavy insulated door. And to take the restaurant metaphor just a little further, inside that box, a metal arm holds something that looks like a tray. On that tray, the bomb technician puts the shell he wants to x-ray. The chart goes in, the door closes. So here you see, for example, a German 7.7 shell with the bottle inside. So it's a bottle like you see over there, we have just filled with a toxic product and put it into the, the explosive. And if you're wondering what's inside that bottle, it's a toxin called diphenylcyanoarsine, also known as Clark 2. A gas mask breaker, we call it. It's a fine grain powder that goes into the gas mask and starts to irritate the eyes, the nose. And so the, the soldiers couldn't wear anymore their uh, gas mask. And after that, they fired the mortal toxic after that. But X-raying and then detonating every bomb one at a time isn't very efficient. It was unique in the world, but we needed a lot of manual intervention. A bomb technician has to put each shell in the X-ray machine and then inside the detonation chamber. And then after each batch, he has to incinerate his clothing and shoes, everything he was wearing. Then he has to get a medical checkup. You can just imagine the time and money these operations take. So we hope to obtain a technique that is more safer for our own personal and more uh, efficient. For proprietary reasons, Nolet couldn't go into what that technique would be exactly. But it is remarkable that so long after the war, a new machine still seems like a wise investment. So I asked him. How long do you think you're going to keep finding things? I think minimum uh, another 100, uh, 100 years. It will stay at the same level. And that level has stayed more or less the same since they started keeping statistics in the 1970s. An average of 150 tons a year. So I was curious, what about the weapons we make today? How can we make those easier to dismantle? Well, the, I think the best way is not to make any, any chemical weapons. Because of the problem that you encounter when you want to deal with them, it's the same problem like with the landmines. It's also uh, very difficult to deal with it once the war is over. And that is definitely something farmer Johan de Vrind can confirm. More than seven months after finding those bombs, his field still looks like there is a war going on with deep pits and trenches. You see what it looks like here. You'd get hurt walking here in the dark. It's a scandal. I couldn't grow anything here for a year. And I hope I can next year. But I've been sent back and forth. Everyone puts the responsibility with someone else. But nobody will help. Nobody. Even the insurance company. They say it's war damage. As a matter of fact, it's not... Uh, uh, our responsibility of the bomb disposal to to clean the field, uh, it's not uh, our responsibility. For Johan de Vriend and many others in Flanders fields, the war isn't quite over yet. We're very happy here to have uh, Jeffrey Johnson, a historian of science and technology at Villanova University, with a special interest in the origin of chemical warfare. Welcome, Jeffrey. Thank you. And Amy Smithson, a senior fellow at the James Martin Center for Nonproliferation Studies, who specializes in modern day chemical and biological weapons and their proliferation. A pleasure to be with you. So chemical weapons are back in the news, and not just because it's the anniversary, the 100th anniversary of the start of World War I which saw the first use of poison gas in warfare. Chemical weapons are still around today and are still causing damage. So let's start off with World War I. I'm going to ask you both to give a, a brief outline of the historical uses of chemical weapons from World War I up until now. And Jeffrey, since you're the historian, can you give us just a brief overview of World War I and what happened there in terms of chemical weapons? To begin with, that is to say in the fall of 1914, Chemical weapons were first suggested 
by uh, the German high command. The Germans were trying to take over small towns and they found the French or the Belgians hiding in cellars and in houses. And so one of the officers on the German general staff suggested we could, they could use some sort of chemical means to clear these places out. The idea was really to use non-lethal means because there had been two Hague conventions in 1899 and 1907 which had prohibited the use of poison or poison gas in warfare. So the Germans initially wanted to adhere to that. And they did, in fact, test in the uh, period from October to the spring of 1915, um, they tested a variety of chemical means and tried a few which weren't very effective. Ultimately, a German academic, Fritz Haber, came up with the idea of using chlorine gas. And chlorine gas, of course, is much more toxic than the other things they had been trying. But the high command by that time had been so frustrated that they felt now they were willing to overlook these potential violations of, uh, of international law. And so they went ahead with uh, Haber's proposal, and that was, of course, first tried out in a large scale in April of 1915. And that was the beginning. What was the response and the counter-response and how, how the escalation happened? Actually, the French had already experimented with tear gas even before the war. Uh, they had had experience in Paris uh, dealing with, um, with burglars and uh, thieves and so forth hiding out in houses, and they had used tear gas for that. So the French had already experimentally tested some tear gas cartridges before the war, and they did uh, ship some of those to the front. But... Those had no noticeable effect on the Germans, except that um, when the Germans finally discovered some of them, they were able to use those as propaganda to justify the use of chlorine later. Um, however, the British, who had essentially ignored the whole uh, idea of chemical warfare on their military side, once they were attacked in April of 1915, did put their scientists to work on trying to uh, devise um, counterattack measures. And the military uh, did finally uh, introduce uh, the same sort of chlorine cloud gas attack at the Battle of Los in October of 1915. So that was 99 years ago. You just heard Jeffrey's story about, uh, about how World War I, uh, sociological evolution of the acceptability of using poison gas uh, in warfare uh, are there modern parallels to that? There are interceding treaties between World War I and the present time. In fact, the public outrage against the widespread use of chemical weapons in World War I pretty much drove international leaders to attempt to create a ban against chemical weapons. Uh, they fell short, but in 1925 they were able to conclude a treaty that banned the use of chemical and biological and toxin weapons. This treaty was subsequently weakened when a number of countries, including the United States, put a condition on the treaty as they ratifying it, saying they would reserve the right to retaliate in kind if another country used chemical weapons against them. So at this point in history, it's still legal to possess chemical weapons, to develop, to test them, to stockpile them. In 1992, negotiations concluded uh, to uh, strengthen this ban. Now it's a, a, internationally a prohibition against the development, production, stockpiling, and use. I think it's fair to say that the prohibitions have gotten progressively stronger. The Chemical Weapons Convention is an incredibly detailed treaty of over 200 pages in scope. And so what one can and cannot do is very clearly spare, uh, spelled out. And that treaty includes on-site inspections of military sites and commercial facilities to make sure that treaties that countries are abiding by their obligations. In the initial treaties uh, that were trying to address this, there was no such thing as on-site inspection. So there were more or less gentlemen's agree agreements. So was that a violation back then? Yes, mm -hmm. indeed. You weren't supposed to do it uh, in the World War I era, but it's even more so a clear prohibition today. And are those conventions for lethal gases only? Are non-lethal gases still allowed, like tear gas, for example? 
Uh, tear gas is allowed uh, not as a, uh, to achieve military purposes, but it is allowed under the Chemical Weapons Convention for purposes of law enforcement and riot control. And uh, this means that police forces can use tear gas or pepper spray, uh, anything that is chemical and, and, and deemed non-lethal. But they are required to declare what they use for those purposes. There are no inspections of this part of the treaty. And uh, it, there are some concerns that the way that the treaty is phrased might open a loophole for countries that seek to perhaps covertly develop additional lethal chemical arms or even crossovers between chemical and biological. I want to ask about the whole process of escalation. Gas warfare seemed to start off on a very small scale. How and why did it escalate? Both sides, both the Germans and the Western Allies, had extremely clever chemists who were very uh, skilled at coming up with um, various kinds of potentially toxic agents. The problem in part was that as each new weapon was introduced, for example, chlorine, the other side found a way of counteracting it using uh, these various kinds of gas protection um, means, ultimately the the uh, modern gas mask, so that um, when a um, when one weapon was neutralized, then they would come up with something else that was more lethal, and then the other side would have to respond. And so you had an escalation both of gas protection as well as of gas weapons. This lasted all throughout the war. The final year of the war was, in, if you look through all of history, gas was probably used most effectively in the final campaigns. The innovation of one particular gas weapon, namely mustard gas, had a very important practical effect, which was that it was very persistent, and once it got on something, on uniforms, on uh, weapons, on, on artillery, etc., it was very hard to remove because it, it has this insidious effect that when you get it on your, on your skin, you don't have an immediate effect, but in a couple of hours, you start to blister. The same thing is if you, if you were to breathe it in, you wouldn't initially notice a problem except perhaps a bad smell. And then after a while, your lungs would start to um, swell. Your mucous membranes were, would be very seriously irritated. Um, in your eyes, it could blind you. It should also be mentioned that uh, because of mustard gas's effect on the skin, there was virtually no protective gear that people could use against it. Amy, you... Uh you talked about uh, the weakening of the treaty because nations reserve the rights to retaliate. Okay? Mm -hmm. Well, if no one has chemical weapons, then retaliation isn't a possibility, is it? So, so it, the clear indication when you reserve the right to retaliate is you have no trust. Uh, of, uh, of the efficacy of the treaty. At the time when the United States finally ratified the Geneva Protocol, mm -hmm. it was 50 years after the treaty was negotiated. Mm -hmm. And at that time, the United States had one of the two largest stockpiles of chemical weapons on the face of the planet. So it was pretty much known that the Soviet Union was loaded for chemical warfare, and so were we, and we were not the only nations that re retained stockpiles. Um, it was only after and leading into the period where the Chemical Weapons Convention was coming into force that the number of countries believed to possess these weapons began to reduce at a fairly drastic rate. Um, in the mid-1980s, there was thought to be about 25 countries who harbored chemical weapons programs. Now the number is down to a very, very small handful, states like North Korea. Syria we're still struggling with, but a couple of others in addition. So. Egypt has not ratified the Chemical Weapons Convention. Israel has signed it, but not ratified it. So what do you think is a driving force in countries finally accepting that well, most countries finally accepting that chemical weapons are completely off the table. Unlike the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, the Chemical Weapons Convention does not have a group of states that are allowed to retain possession of a weapon, nuclear weapons in this case, uh, versus those that are uh, required to forfeit it as a condition of joining the, the treaty. 
Uh, the Chemical Weapons Convention is egalitarian in that regard. So if a country joins it, they agree to relinquish any offensive chemical weapons capabilities. They have production facilities, stockpiles. They are allowed to retain a defensive capability uh, because there was always the thought that well, we can't be 100% sure that those inspections will operate flawlessly. It's a practical approach, uh, driven perhaps also by um, Cold War suspicions. Because if you recall, at the time when this treaty was being negotiated, and it took over two decades to negotiate it, the United States and the Soviet Union, the Warsaw Pact and NATO were made many attempts to negotiate controls on nuclear weapon systems, and the presumption was always that the other side would cheat. So nations can and should be allowed to retain defenses. So there, each state is allowed to have a single small-scale production facility facility where they produce a small amount of chemical warfare agents to test their gas masks, their decontamination systems, uh, antidotes, other medical treatments. And those facilities in particular are inspected with a very close eye. Why are chemical weapons so egregious that they're, they're considered to be uh, inappropriate for war, which is in and of itself egregious? Every military person that I've ever interviewed who's served in conflict dislikes chemical weapons. They're nasty to deal with, but more for them, it's a point of honor to restrict the violence to enemies, combatants, the, the people on the other side wearing uniforms. And as we've already heard, one of the things that is so characteristic of chemical weapons is that it's very difficult to control them. They're at the mercy of meteorological conditions, particularly the wind. And so if all the soldiers have gas masks and protective gears, but the civilians don't, who takes the fall when chemical weapons are used? More often than not, it has been the civilians. And that is something we have definitely seen play out in recent times in Syria. So war becomes, so the rules of war, if you please, become a matter of military honor? In this case, I think that is part and parcel of why the military so wholeheartedly supported the ratification of the Chemical Weapons Convention in the United States. Well, in that sense, that makes World War I a little bit of an outlier. In some ways, World War I is known as the chemist's war, and for good reason, and, and chemists certainly played a role in developing and perhaps even promoting the use of chemical weapons. Can you tell us a little bit about that? The problem of the nature of warfare and its brutality has been with us since the beginning of humanity. There was a progressive effort in the 19th century with rising feelings of internationalism, uh, there was a, an effort to establish limits to the brutality of warfare, particularly in regard to civilians, but also in regard to questions like the uh, treatment of prisoners of war. And also, as mentioned in regard to the Hague Conventions, the prohibition of certain types of weapons that were deemed to be uncivilized. Poison was, I believe, associated with the um, quote-unquote savages that one encountered um, in the course of 19th century imperialism in places like Africa or Latin America, where you would find poisoned spears or uh, poisoned arrows and things like that. And so for a civilized nation, you know, like Germany or England, this was just not acceptable. And so I believe this was probably the reason for writing this into the conventions in 99 and, and 07. Not because anyone was actively developing poison weapons, but because they felt that these were things that, that could and should be kept out of any modern war. And of course, ironically, I think it was precisely when that happened that the European military started to think more seriously about these possibilities. Even in World War I, by and large, the military disliked chemical weapons right from the beginning. The officers and men all together found the use of chemical weapons to be extremely inconvenient, let's put it that way, and impractical from a military perspective. Uh, the other aspect of this is that 
almost immediately, if you look at the at the impact of the first chlorine cloud in, at the Battle of Ypres against the, the British and the French, the thing that became most obvious was that it was a terror weapon. That is to say, it was designed to scare the hell out of soldiers. I mean, this wasn't really perhaps what the the proponents had expected, but this was the effect. It was noticed very early on that that was what it did. And when they realized that it was very difficult to control in, um, in practical battlefield situations where you wanted to integrate chemical weapons into combat, what they, they very, very quickly decided to do on both sides was to use these cloud attacks just every so often in unexpected points on the line as a way of unsettling the men on the other side, um, forcing them to put on their gas masks, sometimes sleep with their gas masks. This uncertainty and the terror that people felt when, when gas was used, I think, was part and parcel of what became ultimately the reason for um, not wanting to use it in a military setting. From the standpoint of military attitudes about chemical weapons, another thing that perhaps should be taken into consideration is that soldiers didn't go on to the battlefields of World War I thinking that they would meet their maker by anything other than the sword or the bullet. You know, there was a certain valor uh, in death by the sword or bullet, but death by chemical weapon, you know? It was an ugly, gruesome, awful death, which is why it had such a terrorizing effect on the troops. But it wasn't necessarily deemed to be a glorious death. No visible wounds. I, during World War I, probably no one expected that 100 years later, these weapons would still be a problem. They have become an environmental problem. You use the chemical, you don't think about how long it persists, uh, and it's still an active agent decades later. And you could say the same thing for um, other things that we use as weapons. For example, depleted uranium uh, that was used, certainly used in the Gulf War as um, armor-piercing weapon against tanks. Mm -hmm. And yet that is also very, very persistent in the environment. When it comes to conventional war, one of the things that often gets left behind are landmines. There's now an international treaty that many most countries of the world have joined banning landmines in their campaigns around the world to safely detect and dispose of these weapons, which harm countless number of people. And that tends to overshadow the fact that leftovers from World War I and from other wars that are chemical munitions are all on, encountered on a routine basis, not only by farmers in the European theater, uh, but in China, where the Japanese imperial forces in World War II left behind considerable numbers of chemical weapons by fishermen uh, around the world because so many rounds were dumped after World War II. So in a variety of places, this continues to come to haunt us. That's also true in Iraq, where in the aftermath of the second Gulf War, despite the fact that in the first Gulf War there was a mandate to disarm Iraq of its chemical, biological, nuclear arms, as well as its long-range missiles, and they did in fact uh, oversee the destruction, the United Nations Special Commission oversaw the destruction of the overwhelming majority of chemical weapons. After the 1991 war, Saddam Hussein's objective was to hide everything that he could from these inspectors. And so after the 2003 war, it has now come to light uh, in a New York Times story that uh, sporadically uh, in, in this last decade, uh, American forces, other forces who were serving in Iraq would come upon small caches, relatively small caches of chemical arms. And by this time, often these weapons are so uh, eroded or they were not necessarily marked to indicate they were chemical weapons. In fact, the Iraqis often mismarked their unconventional weapons in an effort to confuse outsiders. Uh, so this is something that, again, has come to light.
And it's something that also plays into the prospects that perhaps the Islamic State might be able to acquire or use some of these weapons. Uh, Based on what I know from the United Nations Special Commission inspectors and also from what you can read in the New York Times story, the munitions that are likely to still be in Iraq are likely to be in such a degraded state that it would be very hard for them to be militarily useful. Uh, Could they harm people? Uh, Yes, probably just by trying to handle the munitions since they're likely to be so delicate at this point and corroded. Causing widespread harm is unlikely because the materials are likely to be either so degraded in terms of their strength or their condition that they couldn't be fired out of an artillery If, however, the Islamic State fighters are able to get their hands on other chemicals, for example, from chemical companies, things that were more recently produced, they might be able to, you know, release those toxic chemicals and and achieve a military effect. But in the absence of using the chemicals, uh, the psychological impact of uh, spreading the story that you own them also has an impact. Absolutely, particularly on people in that region who have just in the past year witnessed a a series of attacks, uh, I firmly believe, that have been committed by the Syrian government against Syrian civilians. We're talking hundreds, if not a couple of thousand people that may have been killed by this. And the nerve agent used was sarin. And subsequent to that, the Syrian government has continued to use barrel bombs uh, with chlorine cylinders in it to to kill, harm, and terrorize uh, civilians in Syria. So everybody in the Middle East is very aware of chemical weapons. And a lot of Syrian civilians who were willing to stay put in, in, in the middle of a conventional battleground Uh, have fled because of the chemical weapons attacks in Syria. Was that the whole point of those attacks, to to terrorize civilians into leaving the area? When one looks at before and after overhead images of the Ghouta neighborhood of Damascus, it looks to be a tactical way of clearing neighborhoods so that the the buildings can then be simply knocked down and the Syrian army can have at least a clear zone because the neighborhoods that have been attacked with chemical weapons have been rebel strongholds. And if they're, you know, what better way to demoralize and, and do harm to the enemy than to attack their families in their sleep, which is what happened on the night of August the 21st. It was one of the most despicable acts of many, many despicable acts uh, committed by the Assad regime. And yet the Assad regime was forced to to give up its chemical weapons, or at least agree to give them up. Why? It's one of the most um, astonishing uh, things I've seen happen in my lifetime uh, with regard to uh, disarmament of weapon of a weapon of mass destruction. Never before has a state been supposedly stripped of an unconventional weapon in the midst of a war. So a lot of credit has to be given to the Obama administration and to the Russian government for more or less compelling Syria to join the Chemical Weapons Convention. And, you know, the extent of outside assistance and resources that went into making this happen because the the Assad government almost immediately defaulted on a responsibility it's supposed to have under the Chemical Weapons Convention, which is to pay for the destruction of its own weapons. The United States and the international community have paid to have that done. The other thing the Assad government uh, did from the outset was, and we now know this to be the case, was decide to cheat on the treaty because they have refused to destroy facilities that they're obligated to destroy. They have not declared everything that they should declare to the international inspectors. Having said that, it's a remarkable feat to have gotten what appears to be a significant part of the program um, eliminated under the Chemical Weapons Convention. So I'm interested in how you actually destroy chemical <coughs> weapons. Um, Jeff, at, at the end of World War I, were people just burying them or were they actually trying to destroy them? And, and how did 
the process of improving chemical weapons went on, did also the process of destroying chemical weapons also go on and try to improve? The Allies at the end of the war were presented with a serious dilemma uh, trying to eliminate the German stocks of chemical weapons. They thought about a variety of things. Uh, burying was considered to be not really effective because obviously uh, if they simply buried the stuff it could be dug up again and they didn't want to trust the Germans. So uh, the next thing was to try to burn this stuff. And you could do that to some extent, except that um, there was a point at which um, they had a serious accident and an explosion at Brillo that, um, that injured a number of workers and killed a few. And uh, it was a, a really serious problem. And so they had to f- figure out more effective ways of of decontaminating and destroying the, these chemicals. The, the ideal way would have been simply to have, have um, broken them down chemically to make them ineffective. And, but that, of course, required a certain amount of sophistication. And I think that um, one of the possibilities that was also considered was simply uh, dumping stocks into the North Sea, which uh, I know was done after World War II, and it, it may well have also been done after World War I. One acronym that describes the past in terms of technologies is CHASE, for cut holes and sink them. What the United States and other countries did after World War II was literally take old ships out completely loaded with chemical weapons and sink them with the weapons on site. This happened in a number of locations around the world. Uh, In 1985, Congress passed a law requiring the United States to destroy its unitary chemical stockpile. That means the agents that are already fully mixed. And at that time, the Army created a research program to determine what was the best method to do this. And they tested a number of different approaches, but the ones they were primarily interested in were high temperature incineration and uh, neutralization. In their head-to-head tests, high-temperature incineration proved to be more effective at destroying more of the agents. It was called destruction to the six nines. In other words, 99.9999% of the agent would be destroyed by high-temperature incineration. And this is the program that began to move forward in the United States for the destruction of munitions uh, at Johnson Atoll in the Pacific, which is where we took a lot of stuff from Europe and also from the Pacific Theater and where this technology was tested on a fairly large scale. But when these plants began to be built in the United States, the word incineration was, um, well, toxic, so to speak. A lot of people are worried about incineration. And the Army turned out to be particularly lousy at explaining the safeguards that it had put on these incinerators to make sure that agent wasn't going up the stack, that there would be no harm to the public. Having been to uh, one of these facilities and looked at all of this very closely, knowing that the National Academy of Sciences was breathing down the Army's neck every step of the way in this program, my hope was that you know people would come to terms with the fact that this was indeed a very safe way to destroy the U.S. chemical stockpile. Didn't quite work out that way. <laughs> what is the situation now? Is has it been sorted out, or is it still an issue? Well, in a couple of the communities, they're still working to destroy the stockpile using what is known as uh, the alternative technologies to incineration. They are using neutralization, which can, in some cases, be just water added to the agent uh, or uh, another chemical reagent. In fact, that what was that's what was used to destroy Sirius bulk chemical warfare agent and precursor chemicals aboard the USS Cape Ray just a few months ago. But they're also using some biological processes. In Russia, they're using similar processes and then mixing the waste product in a tar-like substance and landfilling it. Under the treaty, it now the Chemical Weapons Convention requires the process to be irreversible, um, environmentally sound, and it prohibits specifically things that were done after previous world wars, which was open pit burning, land burial, and dumping in the ocean. I'm realizing that 
The chemical weapons story is, is really a story of human ingenuity in a twisted way, and I'm not quite sure how to think about it. Is it just twisted human ingenuity? Is it good versus evil? I don't even know if we can think about these things in a vacuum. We can only think about them perhaps in the context of their time. There's a very interesting cartoon that was done during the war by a, um, a neutral a Dutch artist. His name was Louis Remakers. By 1918, he had developed a, um, a cartoon which was labeled The Spirit of German Science. And in this cartoon, he included virtually every possible horrible weapon that science had developed during the war and, of course, identified them, these weapons, with a German chemist sitting in his, standing in his laboratory and looking rather smug as he sort of surveyed his domain. Um, these horror weapons included everything from the torpedoes that sank passenger ships to alleged cholera bacilli that they were trying to use as biological warfare, which actually the Germans never did. But they did, of course, include many chemical weapons. And so the, the German chemists were identified as producing these kinds of horrors. And not coincidentally, one of the Allied post-war inspectors, who was himself a chemist as well as a um, brigadier general in the British Army, whose name was Harold Hartley, uh, when he inspected the German chemical factories at the um, right after the, the war, he, he came back and, and submitted a report. And the concluding passage of this introduction said effectively, Every modern factory is a potential arsenal, and we must therefore take extreme caution on the one hand to ensure that the Germans cannot use chemistry again against us, and at the same time we must develop our own chemical industry to be as dual use as possible in order to make us prepared for the next war. And so Hartley had in effect recharacterized chemistry from being the savior of mankind to now being the potential destroyer of mankind. And yet it's the same chemical factories, the same chemistry, the same products in many cases. So that you could argue that unfortunately for the chemists, they began after the war to get a very bad press. And in a certain sense, they've never recovered from that. One thing that I'm immensely grateful for is that the U.S., European, Australian, Japanese, Canadian chemical industries have been so supportive of the implementation of this treaty. Not only did they show up in Geneva to help make the treaty as operationally practical as it is in terms of inspections that work for the purposes of ensuring compliance while safeguarding proprietary information. But they have, in doing so, I think, shed uh, a legacy from their past because many chemical companies at one point did what their governments asked them to do, and that is make chemicals for purposes of war. And it's with this support of the Chemical Weapons Convention that they have uh, done a tremendous amount to shed that legacy. I'd like to be an optimist about chemical weapons and say humanity can get rid of them completely and never use them again. But it's clear that if people feel back into a corner, they'll use whatever comes to hand. And if chemical weapons come to hand, I suspect they will be used. And I wonder if that's almost a, a, a human flaw in a way. We don't, we're not capable of thinking far enough ahead in terms of here is a solution to a problem now but we don't think forwards what will be the situation 50 years from now. This stuff is still going to be around. Do exactly. we have any responsibility for that? Well, we don't know and we don't study, so then we only learn because we end up living with the history. For Distillations, I'm Michal Meyer. And I'm Bob Kenworthy. Thanks for listening. <laughs>